um, the a ABCs of Invasive Species Organizations. Um, I would like to introduce Chuck Bardron, who has been with the University of Georgia for over 20 years with work focusing on invasive species and information technology. Recently, Chuck is focused on mapping invasive species and tools for early detection and rapid response. He has led development of 66 smartphone applications, including the first apps for the U.S. Forest Service and National Park Service. Websites that he's designed have, re have received over 1.7 billion hits since 2002. In 2013, he was appointed to the National Invasive Species Advisory Council and elected as chair in 2018. Chuck serves, as the, uh, serves on the NASMA Board of Directors, and we're happy to have Chuck here to present, again, the ABCs of Invasive Species Organizations. Oh, thanks, Hannah. Um, and I will um, um, say that, you know, this is meant to be informative, but um, um, it's also meant to be a little bit fun. Um, so, so please take it as that. Um, and, and I'll say that, I'm trying to give an overview of all the different groups doing invasive species work. And I'm sure that I have left one out. Um, and if I did leave your organization out, then I'll have all my information at the end and you can send me an email, let me know. And I'll make sure that next time this presentation is given that um, your group or, or the group you're involved in um, is not left out. Um, and, and I'm going to also say that I'm not necessarily endorsing any of these groups. Um, I, I hate to be politically correct in that way, but I, I'll say I'm not endorsing any of these groups. I'm just, here's what they do. Here's who they are. Um, I, in most cases, I didn't um, point out people unless they were really instrumental or, or it was the board of directors that was obvious as part of this. Um, and I will give credit to Damon Waite, who is now the director of the North Carolina Botanical Gardens, um, probably 10 plus years ago, he gave a version of this presentation and um, was kind of the inspiration for this moving forward. And so um, with that, I'm going to jump into it um, and and please ask any questions or, um, or, or, like I said, provide any comments. So when we talk about invasive species organizations, um, I get who I work for and what I do gets um, gets messed up uh, a lot because there's a bunch of different products and groups that are all tied under the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Um, so whether it's Bugwood, whether it's EdMaps, um, the I've Got One app, there's Forestry Images, Invasive.org, all of that stuff is all under um, the UGA Center's um, role of which I'm the um, the co-director now. So just want to clear up when I'm talking about acronyms, I, sometimes your own organization can be the worst about having a lot of different acronyms. So 20 years ago, there was an executive order that was um, signed by President Clinton um, and then a, another follow-up one done um, at the end of the Obama administration that set up a National Invasive Species Council um, within the U.S. government. And that group was set up as the secretaries and administrators of, of 13 federal departments and, and now also including three White House offices. Um, and so when you talk about the National Invasive Species Council or NISC, NISC is made up of the secretary. So if NISC was to meet, it would be the secretaries or administrators of those federal departments. And I'll, I'll pull that list up um, that would be sitting around the room and talking about invasive species issues. Um, that obviously does not happen very often um, just because of, of the level of, of folks that you're talking about. But, um, and so because of that, it ends up being, um, you know, other staff within those agencies that will get together, talk about ways they can collaborate, um, look at, you know, in the past, this group has drafted the National Invasive Species Management Plan, um, and they have looked at things like interdepartmental budgets um, and, and other ways to work together. Um, the Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, and Department of Commerce co-chair the, the council. 
and so the council has um, staff that works um, that works for them, and and um, and I've highlighted a few of them um, here. Um, there, there's been a, a few different directors in, in the years that this has worked. Um, Stosh Virgil is currently the acting director, um, and they are really the staff that helps, um, you know, guide the discussions, work, um, manages the advisory committee, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, kind of reports on accomplishments, helps coordinate development of the management plan, and, 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 and facilitates communication between different groups. So um, whether it's a National Invasive Species Council staff or National Invasive Species Council secretariat, those are the staff, those are the folks that, that work at that to support that inter, interdepartmental group. Um, then there's the Invasive Species Advisory Committee, or ISAC. Um, ISAC was, um, um, according to its charter, was to was set up to provide information and advice for consideration by the council on invasive species related issues. Um, it is set up to include representations from state, territorial, tribal, local governments, academic institutions non-government organizations and the private sector. Um, it is a federal, um, is chartered under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, and previously it held two, two meetings a year. Um, now it is, it only holds one meeting a year. Um, the meetings are, pub, are, are, are open to the public and the minutes are publicly available. Um, as I think she mentioned in my um, introduction, I'm currently chair of this group. Um, we have, we have 12 members that are currently on um, the ISAC committee, um, and their names are listed here. Blaine Parker, who's with the Columbia Intertribal Fish um, Group, is the vice chair. Um, and the, myself, Bill Hyatt, um, who's just recently retired from Connecticut uh, Department of Environmental Protection, Janice McFarland with Syngenta and Carol Okada, we are both finishing up our second terms um, in May and, and will not, um, you know, and our terms will be over. We're termed out in terms of how long we can be on it. Um, this group, I, I tried to include upcoming meetings is when I talk about the different groups. Um, this group is, is meeting next week um, at the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indians. So it, um, if you're in DC next Tuesday through Thursday, um, then feel free to, uh, to join that meeting. Um, a few things that, that ISAC has done re recently, um, they made some recommendations um, based on stakeholder and other feedback um, back in March of 2018. Um, and part of that was um, for NISC and the agencies to meet more regularly, help streamline federal regulatory processes, um, facilitate open access to data, um, support cooperative invasive species management areas. I'm going to talk more about those in a few minutes. Um, expand the use of the good neighbor neighbor authority. Um, look at ways to fund rapid response. Um, that's something that is always a um, um, you know seems to be a problem having ways to to do that. Um, continue to work and build coordination between states and tribes as well as the federal government. Um, explore some international and regional co coordination and support those groups, um, provide, um, you know, help help promote and develop innovative tools and technologies for, for um, working with invasive species, um, always public engagement, getting the public involved. And then finally, you know, look at the recommendations coming that have come from the previous papers. Um, over the, the past almost 20 years, there's been a a lot of papers that have come out um, and a lot of good information in these. So, um, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, recommend all of you going and looking at, at some of these recommendations that have come out over the past, um, you know, since 2006. Um, there's some good information there and some good resources that can be addressed. Um, even going down to things as simple as, you know, the definition of, of invasive species. When you're talking about at the federal, um, U.S. federal level, there's also um, a handful of different 
um, interagency groups. Um, FICMANU, the Federal Interagency Committee on Management of Noxious and Exotic Weeds. Um, it, as well as the um, Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, those are both groups that have been around for a long time, predating um, the National Invasive Species Council, and and really are, are, are where the coordination occurs in a lot of cases between the different federal agencies, between um, you know Park Service, BLM, Forest Service, between those groups. That's where they get together um, and talk to each other. And 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 more recently, there was a a committee put together on invasive uh, terrestrial animals and pathogens to kind of make sure that that cooperation was happening both on the weed side and on the animal and disease side. Um, another good resource that, um, so the website for, um, for the Invasive Species um, Council Secretary and ISAC is invasivespecies.gov. Um, um, but another great website with a lot of good information is the National Invasive Species Information Center, um, which is which is held under the Department of Agriculture. And this is a great place to look for upcoming events, to look for species profiles and other resources. And that website is invasivespeciesinfo.gov. Um, and, and I would suggest everybody taking a look at it. It's a, it's a real good resource that's out there. Um, so continuing with the acronyms, um, we had NISC, we had ISAC, we um, had FICMANU and ITAP and ANSTF. So the next one is um, NISAW. So NISAW is um, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, this is, I think, coming close to the 20th year of it as well. I think we figured out it was that the first National Invasive Weed Awareness Week, um, NIWA is what it was called, was held in 1999. Um, and, and what NISAW and NIWA have looked like over the years have changed as times have changed. Um, but this is also next week. Um, the ISAC meeting is going to be held as part of, um, as part of that group, as part of that meeting. Um, and uh, there will also be some webinars hosted and um, some talks that will be held at the um, at the House and Senate, um, as well as local events all over the country. And so if you go to Nissaw.org, there's a map that, that shows you some of those local events and, and things going on. So again, that's next week um, and, a, and a longstanding activity um, that um, is out there. Um, so looking at, and, I, and I'm bringing up state councils here, um, because after the National Invasive Species Council was put together, a lot of states put together their own um, state councils, um, kind of modeled off of what um, the National Council was. So in a lot of cases, it's the agencies working together at the state level. In other cases, it's made up of agencies as well as um, nonprofits, academia, um, and private citizens. Um so it really depends on state by state how those exactly look, um, but but in some and in some states they're they're um, you know they're more active than others. It just really depends on how how the state works. Um, in some cases they're more formal than others as well. Um, but you know a lot of work's done at the state level, and sometimes that is split between you know the state department of ag, the state. Um, Department of Natural Resources are similar, and, and even in some states like Georgia, there's a state forestry commission that has regulatory authority and, and does a good bit of invasive species work as well. So, um, you know, at that state level, that's a piece there that I, I didn't want to leave out. Um, another group that is um, is a partnership of, of different um environmental organizations that, that was established in 2003 and, and was really built to, to provide feedback, to provide education, um, to do that kind of outreach is the National Environmental Coalition on Invasive Species. Um, as you can see, it's made up of a lot of different groups, including some I'm going to talk about through the rest of this presentation, but some of them more of like the Nature Conservancy um, National Wildlife Federation, Environmental Law Institute. So, you know, groups that that have that 
may do invasive species work, but not necessarily part of their core um, core mission. Um, another group that, that I've been involved with for a long time is the National Association of Invasive Plant Councils. Um, it was established in 1995 as the National Association of Exotic Pest Plant Councils. And, and with time, um, names have changed. Um, and this is a group that, um, you know, it started out um, with Florida, Tennessee, California, and the Pacific Northwest, um, and has really kind of grown to fill in since then. Um, and, and it's really as much the board of this group um, meets on a um, monthly basis um, with the full, with the kind of executive board meets on a monthly basis, and then the full committee, you know, meets once a quarter via on the phone. And it's as much about sharing information about what's going on and what you can learn from different, um, um, what's going on across the country. Um, here's a map of kind of where there's coverage of these um, exotic plant councils or exotic pest plant councils. Um, in the Southeast, the Southeast Exotic Pest Plant Council is actually going away um, in favor of the state chapters. Um, there's a lot of activity going on with the state chapters now. And so there was really no reason to have a, another organization. So there could be a national one and then there could be the individual state state chapters. So um, some of the things that National, um, national Association of Invasive Plant Councils does is Webinars that they're hosting the webinars next week as part of the um, Nissan event. And so there's going to be four webinars um, next week that um, that you can attend and find out, um, you know, online. I think they're all at three o'clock um, in the Eastern time next week. Um, they've also been working on a on ways to list invasive plants. Um, they started out working through. Um, an ASTM standard to do this, um, that kind of fell, you know, got difficult to keep moving forward. Um, so they've been working with, with folks with APHIS doing risk assessments as well as others to kind of figure out ways to, cut, to sh make sure we list things the same and whether that's how we assess species, you know, when we talk about this, making sure that what we talk about in Georgia and what we talk about in Florida um, is the same, and we're talking about things using the same terminology. Um, and so, you know, the EPSIs have, have throughout history come up with these watch lists, and, and when you have these and you try to combine them, that's when things can get complicated. And so um, the EPSIs have, have, and EPSIs have really made a big push to, to standardize how when they talk about um, invasive plants in, in, in natural areas, usually, um, you know, what that means and how, how they're listed and how they're um, done. Um, another group um, that, that was established in 2010, um, and it kind of came off of a few different efforts, um, is the North American Invasive Species Network. And again, like, um, like some of these other groups I've talked about, um, it's really just a group to share information. Um, the, the concept was let's get together some different academic groups who are primarily doing outreach type work um, and let's get them together and, and talk about ways we can do things better. Um, and there was a, there's a group, Canavio in Mexico, that is really looking at um, um, ecosystems as a whole and biodiversity as a whole but they have a good invasive species program. And so they're part of this from, from the uh, uh, Mexico side. We've also got the Invasive Species Center um, that's in Ontario and Canada that's part of this. And then just different centers at University of Florida, my group at the University of Georgia, group at Colorado State, um, um, Texas, um, Midwest, as well as the New York Invasive Species Research Institute is, is our the newest member to, to join as part of this. Um, this group, um, in, in collaboration with the International Planning Committee, um, hosted the first North American Invasive Species Forum, um, which was previously the Weeds Across Borders meeting um, in 2017 in Savannah, Georgia. 
um, and, and really a way to bring together things on to talk about policy and talk about ways we can do things better across the um, the three countries. Um, that meeting is is hopefully going to happen again. It's probably not going to be in 2019, but probably in 2020. And the hope is that Canabio will be hosting that meeting um, in Mexico. Um, the next group, um, which is the group that's actually hosting this webinar, um, is the North American Invasive Species Management Association. Um, this is a great group. It is a membership, um, um, you know, open membership kind of group where you where you join, um, you know, like 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 a lot of other organizations is is um, supported somewhat by membership. Um, they have an annual conference that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they are now hosting the um, Play Clean Go Standards, um, which is a great outreach tool. Doing webinars such as this one, also doing certification programs and standards programs, both on um, invasive species mapping, as well as weed-free forage and weed-free gravel. Um, and this group is lucky enough to have um, Bell Bergner as its executive director and Hannah Bowers, who introduced me, um, as a communication and program meeting. And, and having those positions in place really helps drive the board of directors and, and keep thing, keeps things moving, um, allows, uh, you know, grant opportunities to be pursued and, um, and really continue to build the organization. Um, and here's just a kind of a mugshot of the latest uh, board of directors, um, as well as, you know, kind of the Play Clean Go information um, that you hopefully have all seen at some point uh, um, in the past. Um, and um, the North American, the NASMA is going to be hosting a joint meeting um, with the New York Invasive Species Research Institute, focusing on connecting science and action. Um, the call for abstracts is out now. Um, the meeting will be held um, late September, early October in Sarasota, Sarasota Springs, New York. Um, so if you're interested, now's the time to uh, get on and, and submit your abstract for that meeting. So the next level um, of really invasive species organizations, I'm going to talk about a few more, but um, when you really get down to the work on the ground, a lot of that is being done by groups called Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, Cooperative Weed Management Areas, or Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management, PRISMs. Um, those are really the groups that are the ones that are doing the on the ground work, doing the group, uh, doing the local level work. Um, usually they have ways where they can work across um, boundaries and borders. Um, they're always a mix of the, the landowners, whether they're federal, state, um, county, or, or NGO, or, or even private. Um, and, and there's been some great success with some of these groups. Um, you know, in, in New York, each of the, the whole states covered with them. Um, and in, in Florida, the whole states covered with them. And, and, and then they've spread out um, um, across with uh, um you know, throughout the country um, to cover different um, different areas and different groups. Um, so, um, it, really good, really good concept. And I'm gonna come back to that um, in just a few minutes. Um, I want to mention a couple other nonprofits that are involved with invasive species. Um, one of them is the Reduce Risk from Invasive Species Coalition. Um, Rick Otis is the current um, president of that. Of that organization. They're based out of DC. Um, they work closely with the Invasive Species Caucus um, within the House. Um, they also have been um, planning and promoting the Invasive Species Awareness um, Week, as well as they do a um, award ceremony and congressional reception um, as part of, part of that organization. So a group really DC focused um, and, and trying to help, you know, educate um, about the invasive species issue. Um, Wildlife Forever is a group out of Minnesota. Um, they are the, um, they hold, host the, and have built the Clean Drain Dry Initiative, which is a um, aquatic um, focused uh, 
outreach campaign. Um, they also partner with us on the Wild Spotter campaign, um, and and you know are looking at you know ways to conserve wildlife. Um, um, and part of that being invasive species, um, they've you know some great educational um, materials as well as um, partnering with groups to to actually have um, cleaning tools that are available. Um, at boat um, dot launches, so you can clean the um, the boats after it come out. They come out out of the water. So another group, um, uh, another nonprofit that is focused on invasive species. Um, the Continental Dialogue on Non-Native Forest Insects and Diseases. Um, another group um, that kind of came out of the Nature Conservancy, um, but but have built a lot of partnerships. Um, they meet annually, usually with the Partners in Community Forestry um, uh, meeting, which is going to be in Cleveland, Ohio this year. Um, and, and this group is where the Don't Move Firewood um, um, campaign really grew out of. And so hopefully all of y'all are familiar with Don't Move Firewood. Um, this is a campaign um, managed by the Nature Conservancy, but a lot of different partners have, have worked on it and and supported it. Um, and just in preparing the update of this presentation, um, they've got some really cool new infographics like the one on the screen um, about um, firewood and the impact and, and how it's moved. Um, so I would I would encourage you to check that out um, and learn and see the opportunities that are there. Um, again, you know, like the Play Clean Go, like the Clean Drain Dry, this is another um, you know, partnership-based group where we're, you know, trying to keep, it's a different message, trying to keep the same um, marketing materials out there when it goes out and, and the public consumes it. Um, as part of that, they have a firewood outreach coordinating initiative, um, and that is a separate entity from Don't Move Firewood, but is there to support it. They do webinars, um, have newsletters, um, and, and I would encourage all of you to, to sign up for that um, as kind of a professional development venue for more about, um, about firewood and the Don't Move Firewood campaign. Um, and this slide, somehow I messed up and got out of order, but this is where the, um, the SISMA, CWMA, and PRISMs exist throughout the U.S., um, at one point, there has been as many as, as 300 of these, some of them more active um, than others. But it's, it's great to see a map and, and really see the spread throughout. And, and, and it's a little unfair because Texas, through their Texas Invaders program, actually have these regional groups that function very much like um, SISMAs or CWMAs that, that probably should be included as part of this. Um, another group that that really... Um, is focused on getting states together with the federal agencies um, and, 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 and really has a productive outcome as the Western Weed Coordinating Committee. Um, they meet annually um, in Las Vegas, usually in late November, early December. Um, but this is where the groups that are working at the state level in those Western states get together and talk about how they can do things better. Um, and a lot of great initiatives have come out of that. I'm going to talk about one of them in a few minutes. But, um, you know, this is the state, the state noxious weed coordinators. And, and if you're from the east, it's kind of a hard thing sometimes to understand that, you know, the western states, you know, because of the history of noxious weeds, um, most every state has a noxious a state level noxious weed coordinator, and they also have you know county level um, noxious weed coordinators, and and that infrastructure there's a lot of great work that goes on, and um, and sometimes us living on the east coast don't don't realize all of that that's going on. Um, so another another group, um, and I uh, I think Bill's actually on the. Um, on the webinar, so uh, it's a good that I, I can give a shout out to the work that the Western Governors Association has done recently. Um, their chair um, is the governor um, from Hawaii, and and one of their main initiatives under his chairmanship is biosecurity and invasive species. And so, um, from the Western U.S. standpoint, they've held a series of webinars. Um, 
and as well as in-person meetings, talking about different aspects of, um, of biosecurity and invasive species and their impacts. And so Western Governors Association, another one of those groups that's out there and, and doing a lot to, um, to you know, build in the um, momentum behind us working on this problem of invasive species. Um, the uh, USDA um, National um, Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, NEFA, um, has groups, four groups throughout the U.S. that are regional um, centers for integrated pest management. Um, and there's a, there's a Western center, a North Central Center, a Northeastern Center, and a Southern Center. And those are groups that, you know, again, you kind of outside what we normally think of about invasive species, but, but interesting in looking at these groups, um, you know, part of what they do is, you know, you know, IPM, you need IPM for, um, for, for managing these invasive species. And so, you know, these center objectives are to build partnerships, build information network, networks, look at ways inside the region and outside the region to build collaboration and cooperation. And each of the um, centers have um, signature programs. And what's very interesting when you look across this at all the different signature programs for the IPM centers, that each of them have a invasive species as one of their signature programs. And, and that was something that um, you know, their individual advisory boards, their individual groups, as they were putting together their most recent plan of works, all identified as something that was important um, was invasive species. So um, the IPM centers are there. They all um, have grant programs where they um, fund different research and different outreach um, and, and working groups. And so a, a very important group to include in the conversation about invasive species organizations. Um, a meeting that that um, not not really an organization, but a but a meeting of invasive species um, information is the Innovations and in Invasive Species Conference. Um, this year will be the third year of this meeting. Um, it's going to take place in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The first two meetings have been in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and so um, this upcoming meeting is a partnership between Invasive Plant Control Incorporated. Pacific Northwest Invasive Plant Council and the Northern Rockies Invasive Plant Council. Um, and so uh, another good opportunity to, to learn more about invasive species and, but not, not really an organization, um, you know, an organization having a meeting, but a meeting that's, that's bringing different organizations together. Um, on the aquatic side, um, I think it's every two years, is the International Conference on Aquatic Invasive Species. Um, it was down in Florida in 2017. Um, it's gonna be in Montreal, Canada um, in 2019. And I think the call for papers for that meeting um, is still available. So ICASE is, is the name that that group goes by. Another, another initiative and another good um, opportunity on the aquatic invasive side of things. Um, this is my random um, slide of other things. Um, there are other organizations and, and some meetings I wanted to mention. Um, there's an international meeting um, that has moved around the world on ecology and management of alien plant invasions. Um, that meeting happens every two years um, and is going to be in Prague um, this year. Um, I think that meeting was um, maybe in 2003 or or something like that. It was in, it was in the U S and held as a joint meeting with, um, um, the weed science society and then, and the ecological society of America, um, down in Fort Lauderdale. And that's the EMAPI meeting. Um, it, the, the, it was in, it was in Hawaii one year. Um, but that's the closest it's been to, um, to the U S since the one in, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, the Neo Biota conference, um, is international conference on biological invasions is very European focused. Um, and, and, and again, also I think is every two years. Um, for, for almost 30 years now, um, USDA has hosted an interagency research forum on invasive species um, in um, usually in the Annapolis, Maryland area. 
Um, unfortunately, this year, I think, was the first year that it did not happen because of the government shutdown. Um, but I think plans are for it to continue in future years. Um, this was originally a gypsy moth, was originally a gypsy moth focused meeting um, that kind of morphed into all um, to all things invasive species. Um, I mentioned Canabio earlier in, in Mexico. Um, in Canada, there is a Canadian Council on Invasive Species, um, and then there's individual councils within each of the provinces or most of each of the provinces. And then there's other groups. Um, in Ontario, the Ontario, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters has a um, program that they're involved in, this Ontario's Invading Species Awareness Program. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of the things going on with um, in Canada um, and, and the councils, kind of their point group, um, as well as the individual councils. Um, on a more regulatory side of things, um, in the U.S., the National Plant Board, as well as regional plant boards, are where, where a lot of the regulatory agencies, the Department of Ag's um, and, and US, the State Department of Ag's and USDA APHIS will get together um, and, and, and work on issues and then at the North American level, um, the North American Plant Pest Organization, NAPO, is where those conversations happen between um, the three countries. Um, I wanted to point out and, and, and thinking about different groups and that do different things on invasive species, um, I thought about, you know, okay, who are some of the other groups, some of the private groups that are out there? And, and as I said at the beginning, I'm not endorsing any, co any, um, any companies as part of this, but uh, when I started thinking about involvement, um, the, the Innovations Conference is hosted with um, Invasive Plant Control Incorporated and, and their um, president and vice president, Steve Manning and Lee Patrick have been very involved and supportive of the exotic pest plant councils and the invasive plant councils through the years. Um, and a lot of the efforts for those things would not have existed with some of, without some of their support. NASMA's current president um, is Kelly Cooley, who is a consultant in Alberta, Canada. Um, he's been very involved in NASMA through the years, as well as um, the in Alberta Invasive Species Council. Um, Jim Burney, who um, has a company, it's Aquatic um, Vegetation Control, in, um, in Florida, um, has been chair of the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, and also very involved in, you know, working on a model of showing how um, these invasive species, um, building a group that he's calling Invasive Species Management Association, um, this starts in Florida initially to kind of talk to um, about the issue of you know, the jobs and, and other things that that supporting invasive species work um, provides. Um, and that's been a great model. And it's, and it's all about, you know, the issue, not not just promoting the, com the companies. Um, and, and Andy um, Canham from um, from South Dakota, um, there was a group that that came together on some different issues around the Missouri River. Um, focused on invasive species, and, and he has stood, s served as chair of that group um, and been very involved. And again, from a from a private contractor um, kind of kind of um, um, focus. And I'm sure there's plenty of others. These were just um, you know four groups that I that that I've crossed paths with a lot and have done a lot. Um, you know, when you start talking about these issues. Um, invasive species, there's a lot of organizations that are not quote unquote invasive species organizations, but still, you know, their members and, and what they talk about in a lot of cases are invasive species issues. So I wanted to highlight the Weed Science Society of America um, and some of their upcoming meetings um, and the Aquatic Plant Management Society is another group that kind of works hand in hand with them on aquatic species. And then groups like Entomology Society of America, um, the American um, APS, which is the Plant Disease um, um, Organization, um, Ecological Society of America, Society for Range Management, Natural Areas Association, the Wildlife Society, the typical soci scientific societies, um, you know, are all doing and, and having sessions and information about invasive species as part of what they do. Um, and that's really continued to grow through the years as, 
as the problem has gotten larger and larger. So in summary, you know, there's a whole bunch of groups out there. And, and like I said, I probably missed, missed a ton and, and, and feel free to email me all you want about them. Um, but, but let, you know, there's all these groups, they vary in different, um, sizes, but, but I, you know, I think a lot of the work is done at that local level and whether you call it a CISMA, a CWMA or a PRISM or whatever else you want to call it, it's, it's that local effort, you know, that flows down from these, um, from the uh, national and international groups down to these groups. And so, you know, there's kind of this logical network. Um, you have the federal agencies that, that exist at the, at the top. Um, and, and, and you can kind of put the, the large nonprofits, you know, there as well. The, these are where the, a lot of the national scope, whether it's on the federal side and, and sometimes on the funding side from the federal agencies. Um, and then you have the, the nonprofits that, that are out there and um, look at things, you know, that kind of support the problem, support the professionals, support the agencies at that level. And then that kind of goes down to, you know, from the government side, the state invasive species councils, which are made up of the state agencies that work together. Um, and then, you know, on kind of the more, um, you know, when I think about invasive plant councils, um, you know, those kind of groups that are truly the nonprofits that, that are more work at the state level and then down to the local level with the CISMAs and the um, CWMAs and all. So, you know, in an ideal world, if things, you know, worked like they were supposed to um, or, or like they would ideally work, um, there would be money fun, fun, money flowing either up or down to projects on the local level where, where work can be done. Um, there would be strategic planning done at the state level um, to make sure that there was some coordination at the larger of the larger landscape things, you know, they would people would get together, figure out what needed to be done at that level, and, and some of the, some of this is happening. Don't get me wrong, um, to ensure that you know individual projects are done at at, at the landscape level, um, there would be some way to map all of this work, both where the populations exist as well as, um, you know, we're leading edges to help better coordinate that. And then, and this was a hard thing to put a slide to, but, um, and then there would be some way that we all talk the same language when we're talking about even what we call it or, um, or how we list it and how we say it's bad, um, you know, whether that's from the legal regulatory side of things or whether that's from the, you know, group that just cares about the problem listing of things, making sure that we're all at least trying to use a, um, a universal way of doing things. So that brings me to the, you know, the summary of all this. And, and I, as I said, a little bit of the more fun part of this. Um, so bear with me here. So when you're thinking about these uh, national or invasive species organizations, you know, as we've seen, they exhibit rapid, uncontrolled growth. They're able to flourish in averse, diverse different habitats. They're able to reproduce asexually by budding. They, you know, they continue to grow. Um, they can withstand long periods of dormancy. Some of these groups are more active sometimes and, and others other, other times. And they can be highly competitive for very limited um, resources. And so, I, and and I think finally, they they seem to be somewhat resistant to control efforts. So, you know, let's move forward with this, knowing that these are the characteristics of what these organizations look like, and let's try to, you know, do prevention whenever possible. So, if you're at a meeting and somebody starts talking about creating a new national invasive species organization, you know, let, let's do what we can to prevent that from happening. Um, you know, that happens sometimes at other meetings of national invasive species organizations. It can happen on conference calls. It can happen at happy hours. You know, it can happen all different kinds of places where we, you know, can try to stop. Hey, no, well, maybe somebody's already doing that. Let's go talk to them. 
Um, you know, maybe we don't need a new outreach campaign because we have Flay Clean Go and Clean Drain Dry and don't let it loose and don't move firewood. But if all else fails and we cannot prevent these new organizations, then that's when early detection rapid response comes in. So if you're at a meeting and this gets proposed, look around the room, find the people who already exist to these other ones and do your best to eradicate this, these new invasive species organizations before they can be established um, and before we have another group out there uh, when we can support some of the groups that already exist. And, and I think that's, that's the point of, of where I wanted to get today is, you know, we hear all these acronyms. Um, there's all these different groups out there. Some of them are doing really great work. I would even say most of them are doing great work. Some of them could be doing things better. But let's support what we have and figure out ways to make what we have work better um, instead of, you know, again, causing a, a new problem. Um, so with that, Here's my contact information. Feel free to email me, call me, um, um, send me um, ugly text, whatever, um, um, if I forgot about your organization. But I hope this was useful to everybody. And, um, and if anybody wants a copy of any of the, the slides, I, I'll be glad to share those with you. And I think the recording will be available to um, NASMA members on the, um, on the NASMA website. So. Um, I guess I can look at the questions and see if um, there's any uh, um, any other uh, questions that come in. Yes, um, one of the um, I, I will mention this um, a conference that I that I left out was the um, Upper uh, Midwest Invasive Species Conference. That that group met with. Um, with NASMA this past year, um, and it was a great meeting in Rochester, Minnesota, um, and they will be meeting again in Duluth, Minnesota um, in 2020. And, um, and the, that last meeting, um, I think there was over um, um, 700 people there from 32 states, um, four provinces and four countries. So um, a great uh, a great meeting, and, um, and I apologize that, that it, um, it was left out of this. Um, yeah, so I, um, I almost hate to um, I almost hate to answer this question. So, without naming names, can you give examples of types of effective great work activities and activities that are not as effective? Well, I, I guess I'll use the example of the Southeast Exotic Pest Plant Council. Um, that group um, had been around for a long time. It was created to help build state agent, state organizations. It was created to um, foster coordination across the region. It was created to have an annual meeting and take some of the burden off of the state agency, state state organizations. Um, and and what what happened was some of the state state organizations grew and became very strong. Um, other state organizations didn't, and the strong ones didn't want to didn't want to have a meeting with the southeast because they wanted to be able to do their own thing. Um, and and then it became a problem of of you know the southeast exotic pest plant council was made up of the presidents of the state agent the state agencies sorry the state organizations. And if you're doing a good job in your state, you don't have the time to provide to work with a different group. And so, you know, it became obvious that there was no real need um, to have this um, this regional organization that we could focus on the state level or we could focus on the national level. So that was a recognition that even though there's a lot of history and a lot of love for what the Southeast EPSI has done, it wasn't needed anymore. Um, you know, I, I think that the coordination is done through groups like um, the Western Weed Coordinating Committee meeting, um, the meeting um, with, with the states working together with the federal agencies in a room. There's great things that always come out of that organization. Um, 
I think the work that's being done in the Everglades, um, even as big as the problem is, everybody works together. Um, everybody supports what each other is doing. And, and, and it's really a great example. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, I think, you know, those are some of the examples. The, the conference in that um, that was in Minnesota last year and, and getting 700 people in a room um, you know, into a conference together to talk about invasive species. You know, that's a great program. Um, so is there a single national organization that's responsible for coordinating state level regulations? Who do the state coordinators answer to? Um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, I, you know, the states are, are, are pretty much independent when it comes to that. I, I will say that the National Plant Board, um, which my understanding is a, um, I, I think it's a nonprofit, but it works to facilitate communication between the states, um, but it doesn't oversee what the states does. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the agencies is being challenged to create a new EDRR process. Um, you know, I, I guess again, I would say let's let's make sure we don't forget what has been done in the past. Um, there's some good uh, materials that that um, that Fikmanu put out originally, um, as well as um, as well as the, there was a huge group that worked on a um, an EDRR framework um, not too many years ago. And so I would always say let's look at some of the existing materials that are out there um, before we we start from scratch. Um, you know, I think there's definitely ways at the agency level um, that things can can always be coordinated and, and work together. Um, and, and and I would say, you know, one example that that has been successful um, is is um, the um, exotic plant management teams within the Park Service. Um, you know, those teams are able to, in a lot of cases, work on the parks that don't have some of the funding that, that the larger parks have and are able to go in and, um, and help those parks out and kind of travel and kind of do some of that um, coordinated rapid response. Um, um, so state agencies are conflicted between, um, between managing invasive species um, and managing invasive species that sell hunting and fishing licenses and protective native protecting native species. Um, yeah, I don't know that that's a little bit outside of, of, of my expertise. Um, but, but I can see that I can see that being a, a problem in cases. And, and I think that's where, um, you know, looking at some of the examples with, um, with the pythons and the hunting programs with the pythons in Florida. Um, you know, there, there's some good examples and some good work out there on, um, on the different, you know, when hunting works, when hunting doesn't work, um, when hunting can be used to, to help regulate populations. Um, good example of a CWMA that's worked to control weeds in agricultural settings. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, the, the state and county structure in the Western states um, and a lot of those Western, um, when they have projects that they work on across county boundaries, then they form weed management areas to tackle a problem. And so, you know, I, I, I can... I can think that there's a lot of different groups um, and I'd hate to point to one over another, but I know that there's being done, work done in, in most of those Western states, you know, across County, when they have a problem, a landowner that has stuff across ca County boundaries, then they can really work together to, um, to, to do things across those boundaries um, related really to ag, um, you know, and, and mostly, um, you know, grazing type um, problems, but ag, ag plants along those lines. Um, yeah, and and one of the comments was things are are you know a lot of cases are, are focused on um, a lot of the sisma work 
is is focused mostly on plants and and um, you know that there's not as much of strike teams when it comes to animals or or even forest problems. Um, but I think there's some opportunities for there depending on how you how you manage the um, the issues. Um, I, I'll go back to the Everglades where. Um, there are a lot of um, reptile problems and a lot of, uh, um, um, you know, fish problems as well. And, and I think they've been able to be more creative and do things that would have been difficult to do within an individual organization by working as part of a, um, a, a regional organization or, or like a CISMA or CWMA. Um, So how can local managers uh, support the development of this process? Who would we voice the need for a national coordination process and program? I mean, I think that, um, you know, working through some of these, these groups um, like NASMA um, and others, um, as well as at the state level um, and at the federal level, I mean, a lot of the work requires funding and it's the legislative branch um, within the state states and within the federal government that authorizes the funding um, and and having that having that funding um, usually allows things to happen a lot easier than without the funding and so um, you know I encouraging people to work together and communicate what's going on and you know tuning into webinars to find out about new ways or different ways people are doing things, you know, as an educator that that's, you know, you got to have the education process, but at the end of the day to really do the, the large scale landscape work, you've got to have the funding to go along with it as well. Um, and so uh, I think that's, you know, working through these different agencies um, and, and as well as, you know, working up through, working with the different organizations and then working up through local agencies, depending on um, um, who the agency is in the area um, is a good way to go. Um, so, um, so, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the question, um, the last question, then we'll wrap up. Um, you know, how can we get more money out? Um, and I think I, I sort of answered that is 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 not always on the on the agencies to do it. It's on Congress to to um, to authorize the money for the agencies to do it. Um, and so I think that's the best way to um, to move things and and to keep things moving. So um, well, thank all of y'all for for tuning in. Um, and uh, you know now let's all get back to. Uh, um, you know, helping solve the problem versus versus talking about the problem.